southeast London. Here's one of those blocks which used to be called industrial dwellings for artisans, built cheaply about a century ago. Southeast London. It was bombed thoroughly and cruelly by Hitler and is still in want of repair. It's a place of small shops and friendly people. There's a different feel about it from the rest of London. Perhaps this is because it was originally in Kent and the name of the county is still remembered. Along the old Kent Road, thousands of Londoners go to the seaside every year. If only they turned off the main road for a moment, they could explore the Weald of Kent, which is that valley country you see at the foot of Rootham Hill. It's really the centre of Kent, and the reason why the county is sometimes called the Garden of England. Spring is a good time to begin to explore the Weald. Spring, when the hop poles are bare and the young hops scarcely discernible against the brown earth, unless you stop and look closely. Now is the time to go down byways slowly. What looks so ordinary as you travel along this Kentish lane has much to show if only you're allowed to stop and get out and look. Even the commonest wildflowers shine. The Kentish poet Edmund Blunden well described this time of year down here. When the young year is sweetest, when the year is a symphony of sounds and sights and seeings. In spring, the middle of the Weald is bright for miles with apple blossom. The Weald of Kent itself runs through the centre of the county from Cow Den on the Sussex border east to Ashford. Oast houses, mills and roads which wind like streams between the orchards. They don't call them orchards in Kent, they call them gardens and the same goes for cherries and hop fields. Perhaps it's because you had to pay the parson tithe on a field or orchard, but not on a garden. Here in Marden, cherries bloom at the end of April and are harvested in June. Let's go and look at Smarden, another village deep in this district of nuts and hops, apples and cherries. There it is, and it's in a part where stone was hard to get. Stone was only used for the church, the most important building in the parish. The houses are mostly of timber, for that was plentiful. In Georgian times, they covered the old walls with weatherboarding like this to keep out the wind and rain. Smarden seems to have looked after its old cottages and repaired them, instead of letting them fall down, as usually happens in villages. Because of this, we can trace the history of the place in its houses. It was once a prosperous centre of the cloth trade, which was the chief industry of Kent in the 15th century and later. And there, I suspect, is the house of the Tudor cloth merchant, who drew attention to his success 
by having this carving done on the Bresima of his gable. There are other such carvings in the village. And although the houses of Smarden have often been converted to other purposes than those for which they were built, this one for instance, the houses are still there. Here, right at the north end of the village, you can see the old cloth hall. 17th century chimney stacks of brick, 17th century tiles, but the outer walls of the cloth hall are older. The oak beams filled in between with plaster. And a single oak branch with a natural curve in it has been used to support the projecting upper story. Round the corner, you can see where the bales of cloth were let down by a pulley into wagons which jolted off down the lane. And that lane still looks today very much as it must have done when Shakespeare was alive. As we leave Smarden by way of the churchyard, I'll quote Blunden again, whose poems are so full of Kent. From this church they led their brides, from this church themselves were led, shoulder high, on these waysides sat to take their beer and bread. Names are gone, what men they were, these their cottages declare. Summer brings the cricket, and Kent is a cricketing county. On the green they watched their sons, playing till too dark to see, as their fathers watched them once, as my father once watched me. And here, probably, Blunden's father watched him play on the play stool at Benenden. Most Kentish villages have a green, and most greens have a cricket pitch. And nearly always it seems that the tower of the church is somewhere near watching the match. Here at Nettlestead, we leave the match and watch the church. I'm always excited by a church I haven't seen before. What's it going to be like? That tower with its small windows, I should think, is Norman. Under these table tombs lie the bones of Georgian yeoman farmers. My goodness! Splendid windows in the nave, about 1450 from the look of them. Very grand for so small a church. Ah, obviously loved and cared for. Those are 17th century monuments to some great folk, either side of the chancel arch. Rather a vivid modern carpet in Mother's Union blue, but here's something terrific. Old stained glass, still in the windows designed for it, canopies, saints, little figures in the top lights, everything. We are told that the art of stained glass has been lost, but that isn't true. People can make any colors now, but what the people knew who made this glass five centuries ago was which color to put against which to bring out the magnificence of each. For instance, those blue jewels, specially leaded into the border of the saint's robe, are shown up by the yellow and white of the border and the red of the robe itself. That's part of the secret of stained glass. It's a Kentish summer. Beyond the Oast Houses is Sissinghurst Castle. At least it's not a castle now, but there must have been something much bigger here once. 
What you're looking at is just the entrance block to a large Tudor mansion. And there was a great house here. It was built by a man named Baker. Bloody Baker, he was called locally, because of all the Protestants he persecuted in the reign of his friend and employer, Queen Mary. I think blood must have soaked into the brick, for it's certainly a most marvellous colour. Kentish Tudor brick is the best-looking brick in England, and nowhere do I know it better than at Sissinghurst. For here, the brick has been specially moulded for window arches and mullions, doorways and chimney stacks. And just about at the time of year that we were making this film, in fact, on August the 15th, but in 1550, Queen Mary did come to stay as Baker's guest. She must have passed through the entrance courtyard, which still remains, and she may have looked up at that brick chimney stack and then walked on and come to this gateway tower. The point about Tudor gardens is that they were enclosed. They were the tapestries that hung on the walls of the house in winter, translated, as it were, into real herbs and flowers. Tudor gardens were secret places in a frame of high brick walls. Lady Nicholson has restored this part of her garden at Sissinghurst back to what the Tudor gardens here must have been like when the great house was still standing. Here's quite a different way of treating a garden. Nothing secret or enclosed. The country around is part of the garden of the house. Whole woods and fields have been landscaped to give it a setting. It's Merriworth Castle, built in 1720 by the son of a rich nobleman who'd been on the grand tour to Italy and wanted to bring Italy back to Kent. He employed a Scottish architect, Colin Campbell, to design it for him and everything has been sacrificed to magnificence on the ground floor. For instance, the only stairways are hidden behind the walls of this great circular entrance hall. They wind up to the gallery on the bedroom floor, and the upstairs bedrooms are nothing compared with the ground floor rooms. And over each of these are carved the symbols that show their various purposes music and embroidery above the entrance to the long gallery. The most splendid of all the rooms. It stretches along the whole of the south front of the house. The idea, you see, was this. When the Kentish skies were grey outside, you had your own private sky to look at, with its gods and goddesses in the clouds. And the plasterers and decorators and painters of these great ceilings took great pride in making it difficult to discern which was carving and which was painting. That urn, for instance, with a decoration around, is painted to look as three-dimensional as possible, so as to blend in with the carved wood of this chimney piece below, which is the real thing. And the light thrown up from snow in the park in winter outside would be heightened by the touches of gold on those leaves and on that goddess. The richest of all the rooms in Meriworth is quite small, the card room. Watch that floor of inlaid parquet. 
In the 18th century, a usual scheme for decoration inside was dark floor, medium colored walls and light ceiling. And the Brussels tapestries around this room represent the four continents. You're looking at Asia. And then from Asia, up to a sky with winds at the corners and in the clouds, the gods of Olympus. Outside the house, the classical fantasy is kept up. From this temple portico, you look across to another temple and all Kent outside is planted to seem as much as possible like those oil-painted landscapes people brought back from the grand tour in Italy that John Fane probably brought back when he built this house. That formal garden in the foreground is Victorian. I think really there should be grass coming right up to here where we're standing. At the end of summer, the hop harvest begins in the Weald. It's really a festival for East London, as Londoners for generations have come down here to pick the hops. For something so near to London, it's strange that there should be anything so remote, hidden and peaceful as Bayham Abbey. It's on the Sussex border and the building was started in about 1250. That's the nave. And it's rather a relief to find a ruin which is quite unofficial like this and not too tidied up and stuck about with notices. Along these cloisters, about six centuries ago, the white cannons must have walked. Here in this silence, it's possible to imagine them in their white habits, leading the austere life peculiar to their branch of the Augustinian order. We know that they were much liked locally, for when the abbey was dissolved, the people round about rose up and drove out the commissioners of Henry VIII. From this chapter house, which we're now coming into, they must have walked out into their great abbey church, which still adjoins it with its choir and transepts and its carved corbels and mouldings, now open to the sky.
Now autumn is here, when hedges glow with red and gold as vivid as Kentish brick and tiles. We started to look at the weald in spring. In autumn, Blunden's lines are still true. The year is still sweet, and the weald a symphony of sounds and sights and seeings. <laughs>